introduction of uh, 2023 meeting of the historical Northampton Historical Commission uh, is being held remotely and as you all heard probably just now that it is being recorded. Um, we always begin these uh, meetings with public comment. If there's any um, person in the audience who has anything they would like to bring to our attention that is not already listed as an item on the agenda, we'd be happy to hear that now. I would. Janet? Yes. Thank you. Although historic district status was to confer protection, such has really been the case on Round Hill Road. However, I would like to report a victory. After viewing trucks and cars wander on the road through the Clark Drive, up and down our drive, up and back from check riders, their drivers seemingly lost, I realized there are no street numbers at the development, despite 23 apartments within the former Hubbard Hall and at least 14 more behind check riders, also unnumbered. I finally called DPW and much to my surprise, received a phone call back from Dave Valletta that afternoon. He had already contacted check writers and told them address numbers are required. Yes, there is an ordinance. And yes, I now look forward to their appearance and hope they comply with HD standards. Item number two, at a historic commission meeting last fall, Martha announced that the Clark School for the Deaf Historic District had been approved by Mass Historic for placement on the National Register of Historic Places. I located a copy of the registration form and was quite taken aback by its content, for it is filled with errors ranging from Round Hill is east of the city to typos, paragraphs lacking, lacking coherence, as well as multiple irrelevancies. Irre a small hen house situated to the south of the shed on the 1910 atlas was not depicted on the 1915 atlas. But all shrink to insignificance when compared to the primary and undeniable distortion that is within the document. One wonders, one has to wonder why Gardner Green Hubbard, Bell's father-in-law, deserves so many paragraphs or why Clark's most significant figure is relegated to the husband of Mabel Bell, doubtless a distraction. Alexander Graham Bell was deeply involved in the Clark School and the spread of oralism. A now discredited pedagogy to teach the deaf to speak and read lips while forbidding any use of sign language, and now also recognized as a pedagogy that contributed to the intellectual abuse of thousands and to the physical abuse of many. The American Association to Promote the Teaching of Speech to the Deaf, founded in 1891, funded by Bell, and with Clark's Caroline Yale leading the way, was an extremely effective propaganda machine. No, oralism was not unique to the Clark School. One has to wonder why the registration forms bibliography lists multiple articles from the Berkshire Eagle and not a single one from the Gazette. Although the creator of the registration form checks the disability box, why isn't there a single reference to a disability historian? And yes, there are many disability historians who have written about the school's fraudulent ped pedagogy as well as others who speak to Clark's allegiance to Bell's commitment to eugenics to include its on-campus Clar Clarence W. Barron Research Department supported by the fundraising efforts of Grace and Calvin Coolidge. And yes, I'll stop with this and jump to the conclusion of my critique of the registration form, which I've sent to Mass Historic. Just as today's historians, politicians, and activists continue to uncover evidence of America's unremitting racism, and that includes the Clark School, so too the abusive and long discredited pedagogy of oralism as perpetuated by Bell and the Clark School for the Deaf must be exposed. I trust the Mass Historical Commission, Massachusetts Historical Commission, will ensure that truth prevail by withdrawing its approval of a Clark School for the Deaf Historic District 
and denying its placement on the National Register of Historic Places until such time when a new registration form includes an accurate and verifiable history of the Clark School for the Deaf. And a quick postscript for today, it may well be time for the city of Northampton and Smith College to issue needed statements of apology for their complicity in Clark's tainted history, a form of re reparations to victims who are still alive to receive them. Thank you. Janet, um, I normally we just move on, but I just wanted to ask you, thank you again once, uh, um, once more for your uh, very detailed eye and um, look at these things. We always really appreciate um, historical accuracy. And if it would not be too much trouble if you could please submit your comments in writing to the department and so we can make sure that um, those get passed on to Mass Historic. I would appreciate that. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks, Janet. And Claudia. Hi, hi, thanks for having me. Um, I just want to start with a story. Sometime last summer, we had, there was a meeting in Florence of people concerned about infill and housing development. And a 40-something-year-old uh, man, I'd say, came to the meeting. And he spent about five or 10 minutes telling us why he was not going to join this public, you know, this citizens action group around zoning and infill because he'd had so many frustrating experiences with the city that he refused to try again to have any influence on policy. So I guess I'm just starting out by saying there's, as people know, there's a lot of frustration and growing anger in the city about infill and housing development. And part of it has to do with the way historical historic preservation or people's view of historic preservation interacts with both the existing policies and zoning in infill and how it's going to impact in the city in the future. Which brings me to, I hope that Sarah shared my letter that I sent about the Barrett planning group and the survey and my concerns about this survey and, and how it was going to be used. So I have two, two concerns about the Barrett survey. And I don't know who oversees, you know, I know that the Historic Commission apparently was involved in developing the RFP and perhaps you oversee the work. I'm not sure how this all uh, plays out, but my my one of my concerns is that the city has farmed out um, a task that will take opinions about what's happening in the city, but has not managed to engage citizens in a conversation. So opinions, people are always expressing their opinions, but I think what's needed in planning, especially in this area where people's very life, you know, and their living situation is affected, is conversation. And the survey is, is I think just a total waste of time. I don't know who's gonna take time to answer this survey. Um, and I'm hoping that this will have nothing to do with any future of planning in the city. So first of all, I think the city, quote unquote, the city, all of us missed an opportunity for actual engagement in this conversation, which is so critical right now in the city. We missed this opportunity to engage ourselves together. And if people were at the community resources meeting last week, you heard Dory, I think her name is Dory Brooks, talk about how she herself was involved in a conflict and how, how well the town she lived in, which I think was in Michigan or whatever, had resolved this by coming together and actually letting people talk to one another, talk to one another with the idea that the outcome would actually not be a, a foregone conclusion. And the, which, so my second um, concern about, uh, just to go to keep into, I have a few notes here. So the first concern is that we farmed this out. And my second concern is that the, the, the mandate of the contract and the RFP seems to restrict the ability of Barrett to contemplate how zoning and infill actually 
um, impact historic preservation. And so I'm talking about historic preservation, not from buildings that are already designated or neighborhoods that are designated, but I'm talking about neighborhoods that matter, sort of that have in my mind historical significance to the city, including my neighborhood, Monfew. So the language says specifically that they don't want Barrett, that they shouldn't go into this area where they're going to be looking at all how already existing plans for infill and urban development will be impacted. And it seems this is a very critical thing to be looking at and if you and I'm not a historian I'm not a urban planner but I've been reading about this and if you type in you know urban planning infill and and, you'll, and historic preservation you'll see this is kind of the crux of the issue what are we saving and what are we throwing away and what is the benefit of infill versus what are the benefits of preservation, whatever that's going to look like. So on those counts, I'm very concerned about the Barrett survey and who's overseeing it. And I hope the commission or somebody in the city, the planning department would clarify for us how it's been going so far. I've been to the meetings. Nobody seems to be in attendance. I went to a Zoom meeting with them where they took no comments. You couldn't comment. And I submitted a question. Um, nobody answered the questions. I don't know if other people submitted them. But so it's just made me uh, more anxious about what's happening, and which brings me to my next topic, which is trust. Like, so who knew that trust, if you type in trust and urban planning, you'll see there is now a whole literature about this on the internet, where just like Dory Brooks said, the idea of citizens trusting what's happening, what the city, their city government and their commissions are doing, there's there's a need to develop a trusting relationship. And somehow this trust will translate even into more sustainable and better development. And I think what the Barrett survey has done and what a lot of these conversations, because people have been coming in front of boards and commissions and the city council now for some time, with worries about this, but there doesn't seem to be any reaction. And I think it's eroded the trust we have that it's going to be in our best interest, that no matter what we say, the city has a plan and they are going to put this plan in, in place. And one of the interesting things about trust and urban development is that even WHO, the World Health Organization, has talked about the impact of trust in decisions about your life on your health and it's called one of the, it's called you know that's a social determinant of health and one of the things they very specifically target is the fact that people feel a sense of inclusion and that they trust what the decisions that they, there's some security in their life so i'll give you a very clear example of this this is just not blather like the man who abuts 107 William Street was very concerned about the development at 107 William Street. He had a problem with his water, the water on his property from another development. This is the man where the city gave him a sump pump because his property floods. He could not participate in conversations about 107. He had had he, very bad falling off of his health over the water situation. And he told me he was worried about his health in terms of participating in the future. So I'm just saying all this because I don't feel like there's a sense of urgency about what's happening. And, and, and it's all going down in real time. Houses are being knocked down. Trees are being knocked down. People are losing faith in the city government. And on some level, I feel like the city is falling apart as a result of this. So I, I guess I'm urging you to, to, to think, if is there a way you can revisit this whole process? Can you expand it? Can you actually come up with some inclusionary language, some forums, some actual situations where the public will feel we, you, we are being listened to and that there's a possibility for change on the other side of the equation. So 
I'm sorry to be so long about this, but I feel like this is a really critical issue, really critical. It's not about history. It's about the future. And I feel like we are putting the future at risk. People cannot afford to stay. They're leaving. You know, it's just it's just becoming more and more treacherous, I would say, to stay the, the city's policies. So I appreciate your taking this seriously, and I appreciate your hearing me out. Thanks. Claudia, thank you. Um, and also, um, we did receive your um, letter that you sent in, and um, we appreciate you uh, recording all this information in writing, and it will certainly go on record. So thank you for um, attending. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I do have one uh, chair's report, just one item because we I know we have to move on. And um, I just wanted to report that uh, Sarah, Sarah and I both received word this afternoon, I think it was, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, from Steve Strymer that um, the National Register nomination for the Florence uh, National Register District is moving along. Um, it looks like they've gotten a preliminary review from Mass Historical, which some kind can take centuries. And um, that's great. And so hopefully we will see that um, moving along and be um, decided upon uh, soon. So it's a very important uh, part of the city and it's great that it's being recognized and also that Steve and his consultants are working on that. So just a little bit of an update. Okay. We have one set of minutes uh, from August 8th. And if you don't remember, this was the hearing that we, um, in, in which we discussed both the, um, the wireless communications at St. John's um, on Elm Street and also the St. John Cantius Church discussion. And uh, anybody's had a chance to review those, um, any comments? And if not, I would take a motion to approve or reject. I would move to approve. Okay, second, Harvey. Okay, Sarah, we need to vote. How we do? If there's any discussion. Uh, none. All right. So roll call. Uh, Greg. He's here. He's here. Um, sort of. Muted. <laughs> Don't see him. All right. Move on. Uh, Steve. Steve, you're uh, muted unless you used a hand signal and you don't have any volume. Yeah. So just use a hand signal for now, then work on your volume. <laughs> okay. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Harvey? Yes. And Martha? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so the next slide on the agenda, this is our public hearing tonight. And um, this is a uh, hearing to determine whether the, whoops, yeah, carriage house, uh, accessory structure at 14 Henshaw Avenue. That's map ID 31B-196 uh, should be determined properly pres preserved pursuant to the city's demolition review ordinance chapter 161 of the general code. Um, now we all have the um, materials in front of us, both the demolition application as well as the B form. And uh, I was a little thrown off there, Sarah, because the um, uh, agenda is return, to, referring to this as a carriage house accessory structure, and I don't believe that's what it is. Oh, geez. That, that's my that's error. Okay. I, yeah, I apologize. I, I see how you did that, and that's fine. This is not an accessory structure. It is a, actually a three-family residence, a permanent oh, okay. residence. residence. 14 Henshaw Avenue was built in 1887, oh, and we have both the view form and um, the application, and I also believe that Charlie Conant is here from uh yes there you are <laughs> smith um Good evening. so uh, normally charlie when we do this uh we like to sort of get a presentation from you and then i will go through with the commission what our uh, procedure options are thanks sir yeah i'm coming in a little bit late on the process but i'm here to, to represent smith as as the administration um, so tom is going to um has been has submitted the applications for us for the demolition and so he's going to present that. Yep. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, my name is Tom Hartman. I'm a principal here at Coleman Hartman Architects here in Amherst, Massachusetts. 
I'm going to give you a brief presentation um, for some of the larger context beyond 14 Henshaw, um, just so that you understand um, the context of it all. Show you a few exterior photographs beyond what was in the application, and then I'll turn it over to you all. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see this okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So here we are, here's the uh, historic district. And what we're gonna talk about right now is these buildings here, okay? So P, that's the Parsons house. That's currently in construction and a major renovation. Here, I can make it a little bigger for you. I saw you adjust your glasses there, Barbara. <laughs> uh, um, 14 Henshaw is right here. These uh, ABCD is the complex formerly known as Friedman now known as Henshaw. And so ABC, and this has been a riddle to figure out, I promise. Um, ABC, Henshaw are buildings that are not in the historic district and they were built after 1945. So they're not subject to any review. Um, D is 19 Hill, Round Hill Road. And there's an application that I submitted on October 13th to start this process of determining um, a certificate of appropriateness. And there is a plan being developed for this entire area to um, remove these buildings and replace them with what I understand are small, highly landscaped parking areas. Um, that work is being done right now. It was just commissioned uh, with Dodson Flinker and the plans are anticipated in the next several months. Um, Sarah and I agreed that with that application for 19 Round Hill Road, we would park it and waive the timeline uh, requirements until a proper presentation can be made to you for consideration on that particular project, okay? Um, so tonight's application in particular is about 14 Henshaw and I just wanna show you the various buildings. So this is 19 Round Hill Road as seen from the street. It's Henshaw D, um, built in uh, 1968, mm -hmm. I think. Hold on a second. Yeah. 1976, uh, I have a set of plans from. So. Uh, here is an internal view of 18 Henshaw, uh, the A, B, and C's, similar architecture. Um, and then this is 14 Henshaw from the street view. And then this is A, uh, Henshaw A behind it. Here's the front elevation. And again, this is built in 1887. The historic name is the Mary Denniston House and it's stick style Queen Anne. This is, you can see the north elevation with Henshaw B and C in the background. And then this is the south elevation of uh, 14 Henshaw. And with that, are there any questions? I just wanna, um, this is Barbara. I just wanna make sure I understand. You're saying that, not that it's something we're supposed to consider, but I just wanna understand. You're talking about demolishing Henshaw A a, B, and C, or what is it, A, B, and D, or whatever, not the one on, we're not talking about the 19 Round Hill, but the other three that are near Correct. 14 Henshaw, and 14 Henshaw in order to put in parking in that whole area. That's correct, that's my understanding. All four of those buildings, okay. All five total, yes, A, right. B, C, D, and 14. All right, okay. 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 But we're uh, really just other... talking about 14 today. Cur tonight, yes. But it is kind of good to know maybe what you're thinking. Sure. Are there other questions of the commissioners? I just wanted to uh, reiterate a couple things. One is that um, the sub uh, we have a subcommittee that reviews demolition applications before we get them, we the full commission get them, and they did meet and uh, find that this building met the criteria for um, uh, the, build, that the, the uh, significance of the building was, uh, was such that it met the criteria for us to consider it as a full commission. So it was um, considered to be historically significant. 
Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, and Barbara alluded to this, is as a, as a commission and overseeing the demolition delay bylaw, we do not have the ability to judge what is going in replacement of these structures. This is really just about determining whether we think that this building is significant enough um, to uh, merit a delay in the demolition of it. Um, and so does everyone understand that? So we're not, um, we are not charged with, you know, saying, oh, we really like the design of the new building that's going in there or the parking lot. That's completely out of our purview. And also, as Sarah mentioned in her staff report, um, all of this work that goes on in here in the future is subject to permitting and a uh, number of other reviews. So this is sort of one of the very first steps and it's on us to decide about this, um, the significance of this building and whether it merits uh, a, a delay in its demolition. Right, and if I can, um, all of the, the whole area and you would need to go through site plan of approval with the planning board and right. BPU st stormwater management. Right. And no work is projected to start, I believe, until January of 2024, regardless, okay. at the Sorry. soonest. Yeah. So are the commissioners, do you understand about our purview? Everyone understand that? OK. So uh, there are a number of things that we need to consider in making this determination. Um, and I'll just go through those with you again. They are in Sarah's staff report, but in case anybody didn't have time, um, and also for the information of, for people who are not on the commission, um, this is what we consider. One is uh, what the current right. condition of the building or structure is. Is it secure? Is it structurally deteriorating? How intact is the building or structure? So has it been altered from its original state, either by additions, enclosures, removals? Um, have portions of it been lost or destroyed? What is the age? We know that to be 1887. Is the building or structure an exemplary representation of a certain style or period? And if so, how many of those exist? I found that interesting in the B form is that it was uh, on the front, it was determined to be um, Queen Anne, which I thought it was. And then inside it said uh, colonial revival. So I don't know, someone's confused. Um, I saw that too, yeah. <laughs> and a little inconsistency, that happens though. Um, what is the building or structure's role in the streetscape? Does it fit into the natural and built fabric of the street? Um, does it frame a prominent corner or view shed? Are there exemplary construction, ele construction elements that embody distinctive characteristics of a period? So does this represent a significant style of architecture? <clears throat> Are the um, buildings form, proportion, plan, style, or materials common to a particular class of resources? Does the building or structure get important information to history? Has the building or structure been designed by a famous or a local architect? And then has the building been removed from its original location? And I don't believe there's any evidence of that. And we don't know who the architect was according to the, B, at least according to the B form, which was done in 2010. Okay, so those, those, that is what we need to consider in making this determination. And again, as Sarah pointed out, um, we have sort of two, uh, two ways we could go with this. One is to find it significant based on all of uh, those factors that I mentioned, put a delay on it of up to 12 months. Or if we find the intent of per, um, purpose of preserving this building is better met through other means, such as documenting it, salvaging materials from the building, um, so forth, that would be an alternative as well. And I just, I would then like to, ask if anybody has any questions and then open this up to discussion by the commission members. So you've all had a chance to review this. <clears throat> What comments do you have? Barbara, I'll start with you. Oh, okay. Well, as you were reading over the, those list of uh, criteria again, I'm sort of marking that I think this building meets a lot of them for wanting to be preferably preserved. Um, I mean, it's unfortunate, of course, I'm, I don't know if anybody's really a fan of those Henshaw buildings. I actually had an office in one of them for a year and it's 
not a very inspiring building from the inside either. Um, <laughs> but, um, and unfortunately this building, which I think just has great style and um, is kind of alone where it is because everything else maybe of that style around it has been slowly whittled away over the years, but there certainly are still other um, uh, similar buildings or buildings that, that are um, original to the neighborhood further down the street. Um, but I still feel that it, um, it should be preserved um, as an example and to show what was on this street. Now, unfortunately, and this happens a lot with demolition review or demolition delay, you know, we, if we were to impose, and I would recommend imposing a year delay, but we know that, that just Smith's not planning to work on this for a year anyway. Um, but I just feel that we um, should say that we, you know, if things were different, we would like it preserved. And I don't know if Smith can somehow incorporate it. I don't, what's the current use of, the, of this building? I can't remember if we were given that information. It's a apartment building, multiple tenants. Right, right. And so Smith has just decided they don't want to continue using it as an apartment building. That's correct. And uh, okay, so um, but and I said it from the outside, it certainly looks to be in in very good condition. Um, I don't know what the inside's like or what kind of upgrades Smith would have to do to it to maintain it. But you know, the the, the whole idea of the demolition delay is to give the owner a chance. I mean, for a conversation either with us or with other people to try and figure out. Could you possibly keep it? Could you adapt it? I mean, obviously, you know, sometimes when you're building a new building, we say, oh, we'll just build onto this. You don't want to build onto it. But um, I still feel that I would I would vote for um, um, to have this preferably preserved and um, delayed any demolition for a year, for up to a year. Um, and if and when it, the year was waited out, I would certainly want it docu heavily documented inside and out. Hey, Barbara, thank you. Harvey, do you have any thoughts? You reviewed it as of the subcommittee. Yeah, I would echo everything Barbara said. I, it is a shame in a way that the worst we could do is, um, is to do what Smith is already going to do, but it does seem to me it would be preferable. It would be nice to preserve this building. Uh, I was, I mean, I also would agree with what Barbara said, that it looked like it was in good shape, but is that true? You know, you can't really tell from the pictures and I've not seen the building. To my knowledge, there's no hazard. I, I would, all, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go just in two minutes, but it does seem to me also that it would be okay. nice to preserve this building if at all possible. Okay. Uh, Steve or Greg, do you have comments? Nothing? Are you there? <laughs> oh, Great, I must go, so. Okay, well, we, we have the quorum, right, Sarah, because it's, Greg joined us. Still vote. We yeah, think. As, as long as Greg votes, I know he, he indicated <laughs> that uh, someone stepped in, but he will need to vote, so Greg, if you can hear us. Okay. Well, Harvey, thank you for- uh, I'm sorry, you. I have to go, so thanks, bye-bye. Nope. No worries, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Greg, okay, there you are. There he is. Whoop. Yep. Did you hear any of our discussion or presentation? Yes, Greg? I did, and I apologize. I'm doing a couple things at once. I apologize. I did hear. Um, but uh, when you start with a vote, uh, I'm still reading the the uh, paper that you uh, sent over. So I'll start with the other folks, and um, I'll finish reading this very quick. Uh, Steve, are you there? Great. You're muted. <laughs> or you have no volume. Oh, dear. <laughs> OK. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Um, I, I need to recuse myself from this issue, which is why I'm not speaking as an employee of the college. You can. Uh, Steve, I'm right, Sarah. He can. Steve can participate in the conversation. He can't vote. Uh, it, if he feels more comfortable recusing himself, he he definitely could do that. He, Steve, you probably would need to do a disclosure form uh, with the appointing authority, which is the mayor. So if you wanted to consider these 
in the future, you could do that. Um, but pro uh, probably best not to for this one would be my advice. Yes, I would like to avoid the appearance of, of conflict um, in any case. So um, okay. yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, so what does that do with our vote, Sarah, if Steve is recusing himself? <laughs> eligible to vote uh so he's not eligible to vote so we're we are still good okay because there we do have a quorum at the meeting but we yeah. just yeah okay all right okay greg do you have any other thoughts any thoughts after reading you're muted <laughs> yeah it's a it's a zoo in here um i'm still reading this just a couple quick seconds if you want to take everybody else's um roll call then I will, I will uh, finish up reading this. Okay, well, I can just um, weigh in, you know, briefly. I don't have a lot to add to what um, Harvey and Barbara have said. I think this is um, quite a beautiful building, and it is a, um, you know, a very fine example of again what I would call Queen Anne or stick style vote. Um, the other thing I just noted is that. Um, in the B form, you know, Bonnie Parsons, who compiled the B form, did um, state that this could be a potential addition to the uh, Elm Street Historic District. And I think that certainly, um, you know, weighed, weighed my decision a lot because I think that it's, it certainly is a, would be a, you know, a tremendous or a, a, an asset to, to include at some point, but um, that's not what we're talking about here tonight. So. I think that um, I would just agree with everything that they said about it. I, I feel like this building should be, um, there should be some attempt to preserve it. And however that happens, um, maybe the parking lot can get reconfigured, use some imagination. And anyway, <laughs> Greg, do you have any, any thoughts on that? And um, I, I do agree. It's a, it's a it is, uh, I think, a significant building, and um, I'm not sure if they have other plans to rebuild the parking lot in another location, um, but I would hate to see something like this significance to be torn down. Okay. So we have uh, four of us contributing. Um, does anybody have anything else to add, Barbara? Nope, I was gonna make a motion, but... Okay. I would move that we find this building, and I guess I have to say map ID 31B 196, 14 Henshaw Avenue to be preferably, preferably preserved and um, to impose a demolition review period of up to 12 months. And did you want to add the provision about and documentation? And once it's over. And certainly, right, if it ended up being demolished, I would want, um, and I think that somewhere there are standards listed for the photography and other documentation of um, the building. Um, something just went out of my head that you <laughs> said. So, well, maybe it'll come to me, but that's my uh, Salvaging emotion. the materials, um, yeah. Yeah, we'd certainly want material salvage, right, right. And, um, yep. Okay. So Greg, you would have to second this. I will second that. Any more discussion? Just the three of us. Okay, then I'll take a vote on it. We'll have Sarah give us, have us take a vote. All right, Greg? Aye. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. So that's unanimous. Okay. Oh, I know what my question was. The way this ordinance works, it's 12 months from the time that the demolition Application, application was um, filed, and what what is that date? December thirteenth. November. Actually, I I submitted it actually on December fourteenth with the building commissioner. Okay. Oh, okay. Because the date on what we have says November seventeenth. Oh. oh yeah, I didn't I didn't look at that again today. So I you know I was just looking at the form. I might have yeah I might have been looking at the other. Um, because there, there have been a few of these going into the building department. Okay. Similar. And I really would like to second, um, say to Charlie and, um, is Thomas the, maybe you already, Tom. you're still there. Tom, sorry, Tom Hartman, sorry. Um, uh, that 
maybe Smith figure out some way to keep this and, you know, build your, how many spaces do you lose by putting your parking around it? You know, it could be, it could be something, particularly if it's in good condition. I'd, I'd really like Smith to just go back and really seriously think about that. Understood. I just, this has nothing to do with the building coming down, but I just have, I'm curious, why does Smith almost all of a sudden need all this parking right there when they haven't had anything forever? I mean, and it's like the faculty have grown and the student population has grown. What's going on? Well, there's always a number of reasons for things happening on campus. There's, there's a couple of um, big, bigger things that are in the background here. One is the geothermal. Mm -hmm. um, project that's going on well, we're converting all of our buildings so um no no but um you know the, the at least the four henshaw buildings um are on steam now and um so the, the decision on those was fairly easy do we put the money into converting those for the geothermal or do we really want to invest in those buildings going uh forward and i think um so that kind of is in the background um just saying and then there's also the campus master plan landscape master plan which um has us um moving parking from central campus to the brie of campus um and that being east there north of elm street however you interpret the direction there so there, there's a desire to push that parking um off the central campus to make more pedestrian ways where there are currently accesses uh, access roads to parking areas and so forth so that's, um, I think, the main impetus is to to move that parking. Uh, okay. We're we're fairly bound in, you know, the perimeter, so um, we don't have many options. And those buildings over there, being what they are, um, are the easiest um, way to create some some surface lots uh, for us without getting into other buildings that are more significant. Fortunately, uh, twelve fourteen or fourteen is um, in the middle of that site now, and. Uh, create some problems for the, the designers to lay out an efficient parking and um, access plan for that particular hillside there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that, certainly. Um, and one other question, did Smith recently purchase this building um, that we just reviewed for, at 14? Is that oh. maybe been in the building for a while? Or has it been I think I've been there. 30 years, and I think we've had it all those years. Okay. Um, so you've always country. been a landlord for... <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I guess so. I'm actually yeah. one of my colleagues that worked in our department, uh, in my office next door to me, lived there for a while um, before she moved on. So is it, so is it Smith Associated people that only, only that get, the, or is it on the rental market? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Um, okay. I think recently it's been more Smith associated with rental. Okay, great. Well, thank you for attending, Charlie. Yeah, and no, that's good to hear everyone's comments. I, I appreciate the architecture also. I see it um, in that building and understand your concerns. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, a if question. I, can, I have just two. I have two quick questions, if I can. Oh, um, sure. So, Sarah, uh, in terms of documenting standards, can you send me a reference for what those standards are, so that I do it? We do it properly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then, with respect to salvage, you'd like to see salvage. What? Who's receiving the salvage materials? So in other words, we can salvage things, but who, who who's receiving it? I mean, we have gone to like Eco Salvage and, and other um, nonprofit recycling facilities. Is that kind of the gist of it? Because that could happen. In other cases where we've had other projects adjacent, we've incorporated elements um, from one building to another building. But um, I would say it would be a donation to a salvage. Um, operation that yeah. makes those materials available. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, eco, yeah, eco building Charlie, bargains. Were you around for the building that um, came down in association with the, I don't remember the address, the association with the um, health center, um, removing the infirmary? Do you remember that? The little uh, Spanish style um, 
cementitious building there. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I was around for that, unfortunately. Yeah, um, and we made an attempt, I think, I thought uh, it was more of a house, though. So. Barbara, do you remember this? Yeah, it was Well, there was some residents, but it that was on West Street. I think that Spanish. No, house, yeah, it's not that one. This yeah, is but it was road. something, oh, was something road. down the end of Paradise Road, I think. That's it. Yeah, on the left hand side, you're going down, and it was quite yeah. a substantial house. And I think we had that yeah. one mm -hmm. documented in the and sal salvage as well. Okay, so that would That's be a good a good thing to look at. Okay, yeah, for the uh, for the apartment houses on the end of Paradise. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought that was yeah yeah. The old infirmary came down, and you built apartments. Nice. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that was the uh, the Drury House, I believe, yeah. at 66 Paradise. Gotcha. We tried to get that moved. Remember that? Yeah. Tried to, yeah. Tried to sell it for a dollar too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you all very much for your evening. Yes, Thomas. Thank you, and thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Okay. We will right. move on to item six on the agenda, which is um, the so Smith Charities of 51 Maine is requesting a support uh, letter, I, supp I suppose, um, uh, for an application they are submitting to the Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund, which is a pro program of the Mass Historical Commission, to, uh, from what I understand, uh, supplement the funding that this Community Preservation Committee recently awarded to the building to um, be able to make up the difference. And um, is it David that you're here? David yes. Murphy, are you here representing Smith Charities? Yes, okay. I am. Um, would you like to fill us in so we can yes. have a- yeah, Yes, I would. And, and okay. first I'd like to say thank you for desiring to preserve Henshaw Avenue building. Uh, I remember when Smith built those, uh, it was an enlightened time when they built those terrible little apartments because the students wanted a certain lifestyle and they accommodated them. Um, they, they were nasty from day one. So I don't have any trouble with them demolishing those, but uh, certainly the Henshaw Avenue building is worth preserving and definitely the building on Round Hill Road. You know, Round Hill Road has a great history in Northampton and uh, that one should never go. So dig in your heels on that one. Um, I, I actually was a member of the Elm Street Historic Commission back in the days when they did the campus center and tried to fix the mess at the, at the art center. Uh, by redoing the front of that after the first version was deemed so ugly they had to go back and work on it again. So Smith doesn't always make the most enlightened decisions uh, uh, when they do architectural decisions. So uh, definitely uh, dig in your heels when you can because uh, what, what's popular in the 70s is not popular 50, 60 years later. And we, when you lose something, it's gone forever. So thank you. Um, now on, on to 51 Main Street. Um, we came to you back in 2000 when we went to Mass Historic for a grant to uh, work on the outside of the building. It's a, a brownstone building um, and brownstone is subject to weather damage. Uh, my predecessors, I'm president of Smith Charities, my predecessors really didn't spend too much time in the building. Uh, you supported our grant application back in 2000. We were successful. And uh, if you remember, we redid the front elevation of the building, but we're left with three other sides that need work. Um, so this application will be to do the east elevation, which is the one that faces the Chinese restaurant where that, that green grassy area is, and uh, in particular to work on a certain chimney. The, the building used to have four chimneys. It has only one left now, and that one is in tough shape. And, and all of this stone is scaling on the different sides of the building. Um, the, Sarah was going to distribute to you the CPC grant application, which basically covers um, what we're going to Mass Historic for. Uh, they did give us a grant in 2000 to work on the front of the building. We're going to go back for another grant um, for the east elevation and, and some work on the roof where we deal with the chimney. And there was, you know, depending on how much money we get, we'll work on the rear and the west elevation that faces what's going to be Chase Bank. Um, so thank you for your previous endorsement and hopefully you'll be willing to endorse the project this time. Um, as Sarah can attest, Mass Historic has some pretty strict requirements um, for bidding and for, uh, for historical accuracy. And when we did the 2000 um, 
grant to them, we did give them a permanent historic restriction on the building. So everything has to be done to the satisfaction of Mass Historic. And anyone who's dealt with them knows they're pickier than pickier than picky. So uh, right down to, I think we had a week long discussion about the grout color for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the putting the stones at the front of the building. But I think it came out great. And uh, so hopefully I'm happy to answer any questions. If you had a chance to review the, the material from the CPC application, the Mass Historic one is actually much more detailed than the CPC one. I was working on it today. Um, but if you have any questions uh, about the history of the building built in 1865-66, um, and, and actually Oliver Smith is a very interesting character. He died before the Civil War. Uh, there was a fabulous trial over his will because his family didn't want the charity to get the money. Uh, it, it, the history is, is pretty amazing. Uh, I don't know how much time you have to listen to it tonight, but tonight's pretty simple. Just would you endorse our application to work on the east elevation of the building and as much more as we can do with whatever money we can acquire. Thank you, David. Uh, Steve, Barbara, um, Greg, do you have questions for David? I have no questions for David. I've known him for many years. Being uh, born and raised in this town, I know that the uh, significance of what they do, and that is a beautiful building from the outside. It would be great to see them. I'm not, Dave, how much room is between the incoming Chase Bank and your building? It's got to be pretty uh, narrow. Well, well, Chase Bank is on the western side of our building, and that, that building actually sits right on its property line. Um, and in fact, they call it Bank Row, the, the alley between uh, where Chase Bank will be and, and Jake's restaurant that goes behind us and, and comes out behind Fitzwillie's. Mm -hmm. they, that building actually, the bank building actually encroaches on that alley by a little bit. They, they, they weren't really good when they built it, so it oversees its lot line a little bit. Um, but it's, it's pretty tight in there. And that elevation is, is, if it wasn't for the chimney, we'd be working on that one because that side um, doesn't get any sun. So the water damage to the stone on that side is worse than it is on the east elevation. The thing about the east elevation is this silly chimney, which we're afraid is going to fall over. So we do the west side, except we're worried about the chimney. And um, while it would make a lot of sense, since the other three are gone, uh, to actually take it down, because of historic restriction, we have to spend the money to preserve it, um, even because it's the last one. Um, so Mass Historic, I talked to them, they said, no, 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 you, you know, you're going to have to spend whatever it takes to keep it there. Um, so we got to keep it there. But, uh, and you can't really see it because it's in the back corner of the building, but it's still there. So we got to spend the money to put it back on the building. Um, but the building is, is, was purposely built by Smith Charities for our offices. It is the oldest building on Lower Main because it's been there since you know, basically the end of the Civil War. We have occupied it since then, and it's perfect for our purposes. Um, and, and if any of you would like to join, I know Sarah's taking a tour of the building. And we have some wonderful action photos of Sarah climbing around up on the scaffolding with a hard hat on, uh, observing the restoration we did on the front of the building. And if any would like to come tour the building, I'm happy to take you through the building because it is a, it's a museum piece uh, for sure. Uh, the most unfortunate thing is uh, that they, in, in probably the late 60s or early 70s, whoever was in charge then redid the lobby based on a bad, bad early 60s bank design and took out some pretty historically significant uh, features. Uh, we have some of them, but not all of them. We'd like to get around to that sometime. But at the moment, the exterior and preserving the, the, the envelope and the integrity of the building is, is what we're interested in doing. So uh, that's, why, that's why we're here um, to, get your, to get a letter of support. And your letter of support is a requirement of Mass Historic to consider our grant. I mean, they're very, they're very strict about the fact that you guys they have to, buy, to, into our, yeah. buy into our work and on this building or we, we can't submit our application. So Barbara, you had a question. I just had a question, Andrew, it was more for Sarah, whether, did we get sent this? It's possible you sent it recently and I didn't see it or? 
I, I sent it in a link um, and I- oh, Okay, maybe I'm it. sorry, maybe I missed that. I haven't yeah, and really- we, It's essentially the same application that um, has come before you in, in a few different iterations for requests for CPA funding. Right. Uh, okay. and, and even before that for a historic structures report. So the mm -hmm. structures report laid out priorities of important right. elements to address right. and continuing the, the workflow right. to get those things right. done. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and again, the, uh, yeah, CPC did fund us uh, quite generously and we'd be looking for uh, mass historic. Uh, actually, CPC has more money than mass historic does. Uh, as it relates to these projects. So um, the mo we're gonna ask for $100,000 from Mass Historic, but typically they don't give any, You know, they say that's the limit to request, but the last time I think the limit was up around there and we received $50,000 and that was the largest grant they gave anybody statewide. So they came in for as much as they came in for anybody um, for us, but uh, we'll ask for that. But what we'll finally be able to do will be based on what we actually succeed in receiving. Um, and we'll do as much work as we can with what we with what we actually get. Steve, and, and do you uh, still have some, I'm oh, sorry, do you still have some CPA funding that hasn't been spent yet or? No, no, no we, um, okay, so the, okay. you know, we, on the front of the building, we exhausted all the funds we had. And, and actually we were very fortunate because Mass Historic had some trailings at the end of the season because they they have to zero out at the end of their fiscal year, June 30. So they actually came back to us a week before the end of the fiscal year and said, <laughs> if you can match another 26,000, we'll give it to you because we have these ex this extra money, we want to spend it. We said, thank you very much. And we did match it and we did spend it. So uh, a lot of these, uh, with a lot of these, you have to spend them out. And uh, we did. Um, to complete the front of the building, we were able to do a little more work on the roof. Um, it has a slate roof, even though you can't see it um, behind the parapet. But um, no, we we did we we have no trailings. We're starting from scratch on this on this next round. Good. Steve, any thoughts, questions? Yeah, I mean, it seems like exactly the thing we want to support, right? And all the elements are in place. Um, you have a significant historic resource. You have a property owner that's seeking rehabilitation. You have a historic structures report to guide the work. You have clearly illustrated plans. You have MHC involved to review the work. I mean, everything is there. So uh, I'm a supporter. Yeah, and I would like to say we have um, some great, assistance on this. Uh, you mentioned her earlier, but Dory Brooks and Jones Winnesett is the architect. They did the first round. Uh, Allegroni from Berkshire County, the masonry company there that is, is well, well known for doing masonry restoration is involved. Structures North is our engineering firm. They're from Salem, Mass. They're renowned in this world. So, you know, we've got great players, a great property, and we're just going to try to stay on it and work around the entire outside of the building till we get the envelope taken care of. Okay, great. So I, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm the CPC representative um, or the representative from the historical mm -hmm. commission CPC, and I'm you know pleased to know that you're seeking additional funds and support because I know that was mm -hmm. a concern. Of the commission. Absolutely. So that's great. Okay. Um, so unless there's uh, any other discussion and Greg looks like he took a break. Um, <laughs> We do we need to vote, Sarah? We don't need to vote on this, do we? We don't. Do we? Uh, to make it cleaner, we should, yeah. Okay. All right. So does someone want to make a motion and then we'll take a vote? Greg, since uh, we are we're voting on whether we want to um, support an epic. Well, someone's making the motion. I move that the historical commission states its support for the Smith Charities application for grant funding from Massachusetts Historical Commission. I second. We enthusiastically support. <laughs> I will accept Any, the amended line. I would, I would, I would amend it to that. <laughs> Any other discussion? All right. I think we can take a vote. All right. Greg? I say yes. Steve? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Right. Unanimous. Enthusiasm. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm. Oh, well, good luck, David. Good luck with that application. I know it's onerous. 
Everyone Thank complains you. about them, so. <laughs> well, they, we, you know, they have a, they have less money than CPC does, and they have a whole oh, state yeah. to deal with. And and last time, you know, I'm I'm leery because last time they were buying a permanent historic restriction on the building with their money. Uh, they've already got that. So I'm hoping they look favorably on us again because this really is, I've got my fingers crossed because this is really a museum piece. It's, it hasn't been too messed up. On, it's been messed up on the inside a little, but not on the outside. So hopefully they go for it. And, and the invitation stands. If you ever want to come over and take a tour, I know we got Sarah all through the building and it's kind of interesting. I don't know if, if we get lucky and we actually can do the project, you're welcome to come climb around on the scaffolding and be adventuresome like Sarah was the last time. But if you want to just come to the inside, that's fine too, because it's really, it's really interesting. And for people who don't know, uh, Oliver Smith, was where Sophia got the money for Smith College. Oliver was the money in the Smith family. Uh, Sophia used the money she got from Oliver at the end of her life to start the college, but Oliver was the money man and he died before the Civil War. So his legacy has lived on and on and on. And uh, we, you know, we, we continue to help people. Um, we, we... All right, well, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. So we're at the end of the agenda. Any other business? Anybody has anyone, any commissioners that have that they would like to bring up? Well, I'd like us to, I know that we are, I think it's just you, me, and Steve are having a meeting with um, the Barrett group about the preservation um, planning. And I Really, I'm very concerned about the misgivings, um, which you can't say we didn't warn <laughs> that we thought that there was something lacking in that um, survey. Um, and I actually had another friend who called me up very upset and said, well, this sounds like, you know, there's sort of a set agenda and this is, that, that it was sort of focusing and leading things in a certain direction that, that maybe some things were already a given. That they, they got that from the, the survey. But I think that we really have to, um, even though I guess I had kind of forgotten that, that our, I didn't really remember that the RFP restricted them from considering um, things like zoning effects on historical preservation, if that's really, I don't know if that's absolutely true, but, and I know that we're fitting in, we're, we're supposed to, we're, the historic preservation plan is part of the sustainability plan, but I think we really have to we have we have to address these issues somehow. So I'm hoping that that can come up at this meeting, the subcommittee meeting that we're having. Yeah, I think this is all good dialogue. Sarah, did you want to say something? You look like you wanted to. Yeah, I'm, I just wanted to make it clear that the consultants weren't restricted in in any way from looking at items related to historic preservation, but that item listed in the RFP was just to make clear that this was not a full master plan process and that it wasn't to include a full analysis of, of zoning okay. and existing policy. Okay. That's but as, you know, as far as anything related to historic preservation, it, everything is absolutely under consideration. They're, they're not restricted in, in any way from looking at anything. Right. But I think it might, really be good of us to mention that, you know, we are getting some feedback and we're also getting, there's obviously a lot of concern in the city about um, zoning and infill and preserving neighborhoods and the issue of, um, what is it, com uh, neighborhood, is it neighborhood conservation districts or commissions? So I'm just hoping that everything's gonna be considered, uh, things like that, so that we're not really overlooking anything. And I, I, I'm hoping also we ask them maybe do they have plans for more um, community discussion, which I think has been lacking. That somehow we figure out a way to do that. Yeah, I think it's important that we'll, we have this meeting coming up and I agree that these are key issues. I think, um, there's some uh, aspects, uh, I was just going back and looking at chapter three or section three, they call it, and, and remembering that we have a, a sort of proposed table of contents in the, in the RFP. And I think um, even some of the discussion earlier today, it's useful sometimes to be able to 
talk about um, in the in the language of historic preservation, we might say threats, right? What are threats to historic resources? So demolition is one kind of threat. Um, incompatible new construction is another kind of threat, and alterations or disfiguring, you know, dis, uh, an incompatible addition or modification is another kind of threat. Oops. And I, I think that chapter three um, could link some of these issues together in an interesting way. Um, for instance, how we talk about the inventory and potential historic resources, because um, some of the things that we're hearing from the community are really about places that are not designated and where there's you know, maybe potential historic resources um, and where a historic district or even a um, architectural review district might be a limited kind of a tool. So um, I think they are really important issues to, to consider and to um, talk about them with respect to those different kinds of impacts, right? The demolition is, is um, obviously the most severe, right? Um, and, um, but compatibility of new construction is a sort of different kind of an issue depending on what um, designation there might be or um, how you think about, how you define the resource, what you think the resource is, right? And then modifications obviously is more the, the domain of design guidelines and the kinds of issues that we talk about in the Elm Street Historic District um, a lot. So I think something like that might clarify what role historic preservation um, regulation could play, what role um, new, des new designations might play, those sorts of things, and that um, clarifying what preservation does or doesn't do um, could be helpful for community understanding, community trust. All really great points. Yeah. Cool. yeah. I and sorry for that distraction. I, I had to move where I was because my device was about to die. So I had to get nearer to a plug so I could plug it in. I thought I'd make it through, but sorry well, for all have, the movement. So let, no as, a, as another issue, I don't know if this will come up or it's maybe maybe one that I think we need to talk about. I was, I'm learning a lot by reading through this very closely over the last few days. And um, I hadn't quite realized for what's happening with foreign base zoning and what's happening with the downtown architectural review district as a result of three different subdistricts there. And it lays it out very clearly. It's actually very useful information for, for thinking about that. Um, so there are a lot of different kinds of tools. There's a lot of different names for the way we um, think about managing the historic resources in the city. It's, it's pretty complex. And so I think trying to uh, lay that out and make that as clear as possible is, um, really important part of the process. Yeah, I think these are all really great. And, you know, um, I think oftentimes we we can get bogged down by um, criticism, but I think this is such a great opportunity to explore all of this and to um, get us on track. And it just, you know, the, that process can be painful. So um, it's, you know, it's, just, it's all good. Um, and we are meeting, um, whatever it is next week, I guess, right? Yeah. We have a date set up, so that's great. Um, so yeah, keep all these things in maybe, mind. Based, based on the fact that we're having this conversation today, maybe it would be appropriate for the subcommittee to report to the whole committee in the in the February meeting just to give a, a, a brief summary of you know, yeah. where we are, what phase it is, what, what chapters are coming next, um, maybe how a little bit more about um, how the draft chapters connect to the phases of work, you know, some of that kind of thing, just to, so we're clear mm -hmm. on it and then we can explain it to community members at the same time, so. I think that's a great, great idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. important. Okay, we'll task you with that, Steve. <laughs> I'll try, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'll ask a lot of questions and take a lot okay. of notes. So. Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm really gonna try and reread. It's been so long since I've read those. Yeah, me too. Chapters. I think I want to reread them, but I remember them being great summaries of what's what, yeah. what's in place and of the sort of the history of preservation and, and looking at it and yeah. trying to discover what our resources are. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, if there are no other um, no other uh, issues, 
uh, we will adjourn. And we meet again at the end of February. I think it's the 27th of the day. Okay. I hope you all have a good February. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. It'll be here before we know it.